uh, this morning we have uh, our dear friend Hendon. Why don't you come up here, Henry? This is Henry who's going to bring the word of the Lord. I guarantee there's going to be some army stories, maybe Brave Heart, maybe Private Ryan, but all of the above. All of the above. I actually saw some of his lines last week at Anthem. I actually went to uh, quote to Gladiator of that district. <laughs> so, Father, I thank you for, for Henry and for Jenny and for Pat and for Elsie that are here today. I thank you for the Venom family. We thank you for the blessing that they have been to, yeah, to us here at The Rock for many years um, through the, the Venom family, but specifically Jen and Henry that have been here the last couple of months, yeah, you and I, Lord God. We thank you that they have brought such life. I thank you they bring experience, they bring passion, they bring a love for Jesus that is very, very contagious, God. And so we want to open our hearts wide to hear what you say through, through Henry today. Let it grab our hearts, I pray for fertile soil. That the, the seed that goes in would, would produce a crop, Lord God. It would, would hold us and would produce something of value and through the preaching of the word. So, God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Sean does many important things here at the church. And one of them is to ensure that we always have water because no one likes a bright preacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> Morning Rockers! It's always a privilege to share the Word of God in any forum, so I thank the leaders at the church for affording me with this wonderful privilege. We've been doing a series looking at Old Testament heroes and how they point us to Christ. Don't we all have a hero? There's Bayern in town, the bad guys are winning, but all is not lost in from the A-team in their back van or William Wallace on a horseback with his Excalibur sword shouting they may take our lives but they'll never take our freedom or Superman flying in with a cape or Jason Bourne, Charlie's Angels, Dirty Harry, go ahead punk, make my day. Bond, James Bond. 007, license to kill. <laughs> and it's Aston Martin. And from cover to cover, the word of God is made up of heroes. But here's the difference. They don't wear a cape, or cloaks, or masks, or underpants on the outside. <laughs> and the exception of Samson, they don't have superhuman powers. They aren't heroes, so God uses them. But rather, it's because they allow God to use them, ordinary men and women like you and I, they become heroes. You know, um, do any of you know anyone with the name of Shammah, Shafat, Setu, Palti, Gil, Amiel, Gadi, Nabi, Gil, Eagle? A bit disappointed. Why's that? Because no one wants to name their children after cowards, but we all know Caleb and Joshua. The first ten names were the other ten yellow belly wimps that went with Caleb and Joshua to spy out the land, but came back with a negative report. We had a friend of ours that was a glimmer with us, his name was Buford. And I asked him one day, if it's an unusual name, why are you named Buford? He said his dad, his favorite movie was a movie called Walking Tall, and it's the story of a Tennessee sheriff in the 1960s that cleans out the town of all its bad guys. And he said, I want a son with that name. So let's have a look how the Israelites got you up to the point where the 12 spies were sent in to do a reconnaissance of the land. The Israelites, as we know, had escaped the clutches of Pharaoh and they'd arrived at Kadesh Barnea. It was to be a slam dunk. A mere formality, all they had to do was do the recce, check out the land, take possession, simple, the match was fixed. They win. So Moses, as you know, chooses 12 leaders, one from each of the tribes, and they go and spy out the land. Remember, God had already given them the land, because we read in Deuteronomy 1 verse 8, See, I have given you this land, go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore he would give to your fathers. Secondly, he would already said to them that he would fight for them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you victory, Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. 
through a series of events, he had already shown that he could be trusted. He parted the Red Sea. He destroyed the might of the Egyptian army. He fed their manna, fresh manna every morning. He had purified the waters, the bitter waters at Marah. He had helped them defeat the Amalekites at Rephidim. Remember, at this stage, they were still just a bunch of inequipped slaves that beat an established army. The match was fixed. They won. All they had to do was turn up. They should be feeling on top of their game, bulletproof, ready to take on the wall. But this is what those 10 yellow belly weasels had to say. Numbers 13. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Tick. He has its fruit. Tick. And here comes the butt. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. I jump to 31. We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread amongst the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. And as a result, we know that the Israelites rebel. And it's no surprise, as their leaders had already tapped out and raised the white flag. There it comes, Mark. I remember watching a documentary 10 years ago on the, and it was a, uh, um, uh, to commemorate, I think it was the 60th anniversary of the landings of D-Day, Normandy. And as we know, it was one of the most infamous days in history. Uh, it was a day that on both sides saw 20,000 men die in one day. It's been aptly called the longest day in history. And for those that didn't drown because of the heavy pack of water in the rough seas, when they jumped off the, the, the barges and the ships, most were seasick as they hit the booby-trapped beaches with unrelenting fire from an enemy that was well dug in and had years to prepare for this. Historians tell us that at best, all they had to hide behind was rocks the size of soccer balls. A rifle man, now obviously an old man because it was 60 years hence, was asked why he kept moving forward despite seeing hundreds of his comrades in arms falling in the front, left and right of him, and some literally blown to pieces. His answer simple. He said, we looked up and saw our leaders charging forward, so we followed. The power of leadership, whether at home or at the office, never underestimate, friends, the impact and power you wield. Whether it's parents or bosses, or teachers, or school leaders, uh, church leaders, or husbands, or wives, there's power in your words and in your actions, we know that. So be careful how you wield that sword. But Caleb and Joshua, our heroes, cry out in Numbers 14, verse 7 through 9. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flying with milk and honey. Milk speaks of sustenance, honey, the sweetness, the grace of God. And will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land. Because we will swallow them up. Their protection is God. Is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. The match is fixed. We win. To fully understand how the Israelites found themselves in this position. We have to go back 2,500 years into the book of Genesis. God lacking nothing. Needing nothing. Created man to have fellowship with him, and we read it was very good. The Creator wanted to hang out with his creation. We read that God and man walked together in the cool of the day. My mind, mind runs wild with this. I love that line walk together in the cool of the day. My imagination has been walking, having God and man walking arm in arm, sharing an apple, picking up stones and tripping them across the Tigris, dangling their feet in the cool waters of the Euphrates, sharing deep inner thoughts. It was very good. But as we know, God didn't want robots, and so He gave them a free will, a choice. He said, you can eat from any tree in the garden, Genesis 2.16. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. My brother lives in LA, and when we've gone to visit over the years, I've always tried to go to Disney. I think it's a child in all of us. And when you walk through the gate, there are just these hundreds of rides. And it's like God saying, you can ride on any of these. But that rickety wooden roller coaster in the corner, please stay away from it, it's broken, you will die if you ride on it. And they exercised this wonderful gift of choice that he gave us, but for the wrong reason, and sin entered into the world. And with this first sin of rebellion, we know that every other sin followed. Murder, deceit, envy, pride, every bit of sexual immorality, my goodness me, there's a lot of that. Pornography, hatred, gossip, slander. 
rage, drunkenness? Is anyone left standing? I'm certainly not. And in Genesis, what started in the cool of the day, God's plan, ended in a coffin at the end of Genesis. God's perfect plan, man puts his grubby hands in it. It starts in the garden, it ends in the coffin, because we read in Genesis 50, so Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. You see, God should have obliterated and started again, but for his grace. And we serve, serve a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, and in my case, a God of 20 chances. And God immediately, as we read, provided Adam with a lamb, which he was slaughtered, and he could cover his nakedness. And then he reached out to his people through leaders like Noah, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, all trustees of God's grace. A plan to restore man's fallen state and return him to the promised land. But despite God extending His grace time and time and time again, the Israelites had returned to their wicked ways, which culminated in their captivity in Egypt, which was the lowest point in the history. And to quote Francis Thompson, the hand of heaven never gives up and once again reaches out to His people as He does today, time and time and time again. And we read in Exodus 3 verse 9, And now the power of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are, are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And a relentless God says eight times to Pharaoh through Moses, let my people go. And eventually after being smacked black and blue, Pharaoh relents. And off the Israelites, army, uh, the, the Israelites go on a journey which should have only taken them two weeks. 350 kilometers. Peter married to bring them back twice. Things were finally happening. Freedom and their rich inheritance was a mere fortnight away. They were finally being restored to their promised land, a land of milk and honey, a land where we told it took two men to carry one cluster of grapes, but for the debacle caused by those, 12, those 10 spies at Kadesh Barnea. And because of this, they get sentenced, as we know, to 40 years in the wilderness, which sure our entire generation, or Joshua and Caleb die, they had denied themselves this rich inheritance. And why is it significant to us today? Well, they say what it happens physically in the Old Testament can often apply to our lives spiritually today. And so three things we take from this or glean from this. One, the Israelites came out of Egypt. They were delivered from their slavery. Most people here have come out of Egypt and have been set free from the bondages of your past life. The room is full of testimonies of God's goodness, of drugs and adultery and alcoholism and everything in between. Rejection, atheism, hedonism and every other ism. But secondly, not everyone you are sitting has gone into the promised land that God has set aside for you. You haven't laid hold truly of the land flowing with milk and honey. And I'm not preaching a prosperity message here, but living in the victory and the joy despite, despite the challenges that get thrown in your way. And so end up thirdly, meandering around the desert. I know Jen wouldn't mind me sharing this, but me and her found ourselves in that space. We come to faith in October 2000, we joined Glenridge, we had our salvation, we had been set free from the sin that had absolutely entangled us and, and throttled us. We now had purpose, we were spirit filled, we were water baptized, we serve a personal God, we knew our name. We're enjoying a wonderful community of friends that was Glenridge, that is Glenridge. And yes, the thing that although we had fully come out of Egypt, there was something still of Egypt inside of us and we hadn't quite come into the full freedom of what God had for us. We love God. We absolutely love God. We love each other. We absolutely loved each other. We were at every meeting and we loved it. I always joke, if the meeting was called at 2 o'clock in the morning, we would have been there. We ministered and testified wherever we went about the goodness of God. I sat and I met with every single one of my unsaved mates and told them about Jesus. But we never really understood it, the full and complete work of the cross. We labored in the wilderness of unforgiveness and issues of our past. I didn't get it that Jesus was beaten up, so I no longer had to beat myself up. He, hadn't, he had taken the shame of hanging butt naked on the cross, but I still carried the shame of my poor decisions that I've made in my past and how I've hurt so many. He forgave his 
accuse us so that we can run under the applause of heaven, yet we both stew with unforgiveness, Jen towards me, me towards myself. Jen hadn't realized that Jesus had become a victim, so she no longer needed to be one. We weren't living in the completed work of the cross. We both walked with limbs, and this was manifest in the most horrendous arguments, screaming and shouting, mostly for me, with two little kids in the home. And one of these occasions, I called out the corner of my eye, something new, and I looked out my window, and I saw my six-year-old daughter running up the driveway and down the road, laying after her. There were times we were screaming and shouting on the way to church, and then we'd get out and beat everyone like we do. Hey, been bro, no good. Luckily, Jen, which was big, because it was two weeks that I sat on one side of the church, and she sat on the other. I won't get away with that, Jen. <laughs> There were two pivotal moments for the two of us as we serve this personal God. For me, Gloria preached a specific message on an issue that was really laboring and, and weighing me down and it was robbing me of my inheritance. And he asked anyone who was, that was going through the same thing to stand. And I closed my eyes and stood, but by the noise around me, I knew there were many standing. And he was praying because he was using this microphone. I don't know where he was. And when I opened my eyes, he was standing in front of me with his hands like this. And in that moment, I felt this weight come off my shoulder. For the first time, I felt that I drank of the milk and ate of the honey. Yeah. And then Jen went to her in a ladies camp and she just wept the weekend as she allowed the Spirit of God to wash her over her and then take her by the hand and lead her into her inheritance. And we were truly set free and we entered into our promised land after walking with God for I don't know how many years. You see, it was always ours. We just didn't take the labor, take hold of it and marched in. You know what, and there are many fortified cities, and there are many giants. But we've overcome many, and there are many who are still fighting. But yes, I think we're fighting them in the promised stand that God intended us. And something I want to add, you know, just, you know when, you, when, when, when you're in the wilderness, sometimes Egypt looks good, and we see the Israelites longing to go back to Egypt. And our charismatics call it backsliding. The scriptures talk about a dog returning to its vomit. But when you're living in the fullness of God, when you're living in that, 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 that inheritance that God had intended for you, you see Egypt for what it is, slavery, death, and destruction. And there's no way that you'll look back or long after that miserable life. And so, Rockers, I just want to say to you, God wants you to lay hold of that rich inheritance in the promised land, free of shackles of your past life. And there are 9,000 scriptures, uh, promises in God, I'm told, I haven't counted them. Many of them. Colossians, John 1, I'm a now child of God. I've been redeemed and forgiven all my sins, Colossians 1. I'm now complete in Christ, Colossians 2, and 8,997 other promises. You see, the match is fixed. We win. Stop meandering around the wilderness. Go and lay hold of the rich inheritance. But it will require faith and warfare as there are giants and there are fortified cities. So we read that Joshua gets chosen as Moses' the successor to lead the Israelites into the promised land. But that's not what made him a hero. So what made him a hero? We know that he never had any superhuman powers. He didn't find a cake. He didn't have an Aston Martin or rode on a horseback or came in on a black van. I always saw him as a kind of William Wallace dude. Muscles bulging, tattoo clad, wielding an Excalibur sword. But as I've read other commentaries over the years, I've been incredibly disappointed to learn that he was actually an old man. <laughs> he was about 70 or 80 when he took over leadership of the, of the Israelites. Remember he was about 30, 40, not quite sure that the theologians not quite sure, but around about 30 or 40 when he left Egypt and then they meandered the, the, the desert for 40 years. So he was an, actually an old man with a beer book limping around like the rest of us old sports injuries. <laughs> so he had no physical attributes that made him a hero, so what was it? Number one, he was a faithful man. The first time we read in Joshua, 1 verse 1, 1 verse 1, he's mentioned as Moses' A. Not a glory boy, not a rock star, not the most valuable player, not a CEO, not a social media influencer, but a servant, a personal valet, an assistant, and to use a bit South Africanism, an happy. So opposite to the world today, where ambition and striving for success is to see as an admired attribute, and something to be applauded. Secondly, not only was he a faithful man, but he was a man of faith. He saw the giants in the land and the fortified cities, but he had the same blind faith 
that David had when he eyeballed Goliath, or Daniel had when he stepped into the lion's den, or even that one, the guy with the greatest faith, the thief on the cross that looked at bloody Jesus dying and held him as king. Hebrew 1 starts with, Now faith is confident in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. And then goes on to list this list of heroes that we're looking at, one by one. And the one thing they have in common is two words, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, every single one of them. Joshua knew it was not by his ability, but by God's spoken word. He knew by faith that the match was fixed and that victory was theirs. Thirdly, he was a tea man, happy to get his hands dirty, not in the trenches, not that dirt up in some executive office on the 10th floor. The first mention in scripture, he is fighting the Melekites in the valley. And in Exodus 17 verse 9 we read, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go, and fight, go out to fight the Melekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with a staff of God in my hand. A wonderful picture of this old man Moses battling to keep his hands up, but in a position of worship and prayer, with a staff in his hand, and her and Aaron holding his hands up because he can't keep them myself, and Joshua in the valley, fighting. Not in the elevated position, in the valley, fighting. And one of the best lessons I think I've learned in teamwork was taught to me by a schoolboy. His name is George Earl, and I hope he gets to hear this. In 2003, I was coaching under 16A rugby at Westville. It was a big match, so it couldn't have been Northwood. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe it was clear. It was a big match. We were unbeaten. But that's the thing, my locks were injured. And George Earl played flank, big boy. So I called him and I said, Georgie, will you play flank, will you play lock for me? And he's off your context and he said, but sir, I'm a, I'm, I'm a loose boy. I said, I know you are Georgie, but the team needs you. He looked at me and he said, sir, if the team needs me, I'll play lock for you. Not only did we win that game, thanks to Georgie, prepared to play lock, but we went through the season unbeaten. And that day when we started playing lock was the start of what later would become a professional career of over 250 first class rugby matches after he left school. We played for the Cheetahs, we played for the Golden Lions, the Cardiff Blues, the Scarlets, and he's currently playing for the Colomiers in France, all at lock. The fourth thing, Joshua was aware of his humanity and vulnerabilities, and this is a big one. Eight times, God says to him, be strong and courageous. Eight times. I don't think, Ninama or Rasi said to Yevon Etzebeth last night, be strong and courageous. Because <laughs> when you're beaming with confidence, you don't need to be told that. Why did God have to tell him eight times? Not once, eight times. Because he felt weak, he felt frightened, he felt vulnerable, and he was aware of his inadequacies, just like God would have it. Because we read in scripture, in that place you rely on God. And he says, my power is made perfect in your humanity, in your weakness. It's all right to feel vulnerable and weak, rock, especially at a time like this. Sometimes as believers, we feel that when we're feeling this way, we, we're acting without faith or we're questioning God or, or even committing a sin. You're human. How can you not be worried about what's happening in the world locally and internationally right now? Every night, Jen and I watch Sky, BBC, and CNN News. The world is in a mess. Politically, economically, socially, and everything in between. The only encouragement I take while watching those news networks is to realize that we're not the only ones in South Africa that are going through a hard time. But God would say to you, rockers, be strong and courageous. As Christians, we feel that we have to have it all together. Joshua didn't. He was honest about his fears and insecurities and he just pressed into the promise of God. It's all right, friends, to see and be concerned about the looting, the flooding, the corruption, the crime, the inflation, the power outages, the fragmentation of, of the moral fiber of our society, the invasion into Ukraine, and the ripple effect it's having around the world, but they are just giants in fortified cities. Don't be like those ten yellow-bellied weasels and be defined by it, but and allow your joy to be stolen by it, but rather stand firm 
on God's promises. Joshua knew these were only giants and fortified cities, but he looks past these and he sees a bigger God that hovered over the land that he had promised. He realized the nature was fixed. We win. He knew his God could be trusted and he held on to those same promises that God had made about giving them every place they set their feet, about defending their house against marauding forces, about never again allowing oppressors to overrun them, and that God said himself, I'll be the wall of fire. Are you holding on to the promises of God in this time, and the times are tough, or are you seeing the giants in the fortified cities? The victory is ours, rockers. The old Moody says this, Terry, which means hang around. Terry had a promise, and God will meet you there. The match is fixed, we will. Fifthly, he served God wholeheartedly. We, we read that he served God with all his heart, soul, body, and mind. Payne Stewart was my favorite golfer. And he was being interviewed for some magazine. And the interviewer asked him how he would like to be remembered. And I'm sure he expected to, for him to list his accolades and list of, list of things because he had already at that stage won three major titles. He had 11 PGA wins. He had won the, he'd been part of the USA winning Ryder Cup team of 1999. He'd received the coveted Byron Nelson Award. He'd be, he even received the award for the best dressed golfer and had made a cameo appearance on the sitcom Home Improvements. There was much that Payne Street could draw from. And without hesitating, he said, I want to be remembered as a God fearing man. He served God with everything, including his golf. A few months later, in 1999, he tragically died at age of 42 in an airplane crash. Can you imagine that moment when he stepped through the curtain without his golf clubs and he meets the God whom he served with all his body, soul, and mind? Joshua, the hero, as he leaves absolutely nothing out there. At the end of his life, Joshua stands up in front of the Israel community and he says this, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. How many of us can truly say that? The world and many in the church unfortunately serve many other things, money, prestige, materialism, acceptance, and the applause of man. The pursuit of happiness is a big one. The God of self and unfortunately the idol of your child. But as for me and my household, you finish it. And most of all, he's a hero, as he's a picture of the true Joshua to come. Now the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek, and Joshua is the Hebrew version of the Greek Jesus. Joshua is a deliverer who rescued sinners and led them into a promised land, just like Jesus. He's a warrior who conquered his enemies, just like Jesus. He's a victor who shares the inheritance with his people, just like Jesus. You know, for ancient Israelites, this was their lived happily ever after story, which they had sought since they were expelled from the garden. For the first time in thousands of years, the people of Israel were coming back into the land that God had promised as an eternal possession. So Jesus, after conquering death, brings his people into a great inheritance. We've all been forgiven of all our sins. We've been reconciled, or reconciled with the Father, and once again, to walk with Him in the cool of the day. There's also this eschatological accept, aspect to our inheritance that will be fully revealed when our Jesus returns and the dead are raised. And as Joshua gives the people rest in the land of promise, of Christ promises an eternal life, a home where we are told there is no more tears, heartache, pain, looting, crime, cancer, dementia, death, eternity with Jesus and our loved ones. What a glorious promise they have. Match is fixed. We win. And finally, he allies the true hero. He was a servant leader just by Jesus. And it's quite interesting. The second most played song at a funeral, the first is Amazing Grace. The second most is um, Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. And the world applauds us, and it's worn like a badge, and it's all about me, and self-centered, about my achievements, about my ambition. And normally, somewhere along the line, as we walk into many memorials and uh, funerals, 
there's a list of achievements and accolades about the person that we're coming to say goodbye to. But just the thing, Joshua's eulogy recounts none of his victories or all his successes. Nothing about being a, a mighty warrior or a great leader or to quote a current leader, the man that made the Israelites great again. But it highlights his faithful service to the Lord. Joshua 20 verse 29, 34 verse 29. After these things, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died. Now each of us are going to stand before the Lord one day at a great audience of one. And the King of Kings, we are told, will say if we deserve it, well done, good and faithful, CEO. Well done, good and faithful, entrepreneur. Mother, father, teacher, boss, IT wizard, plumber. No, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, he did it God's way, echoing the words of Paul. But where whatever gain I have, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The match is fixed. We win. Amen. Thank you for joining the Rock Church broadcast service. We have reached the end of our service today. To find out more about who we are, visit our website at www.therock.org.za or contact our office on office at therock.org.za. Please join us again next week, the same time on the same platform.